Hey everybody. So today we're going to continue from where we left off last week and we're going to explore Racket a little bit more deeply. So like last week, this is going to be mostly about introducing you to Racket concepts, how they relate to OCaml concepts you're familiar with, but not really be about exploring the standard library or different APIs. This is about the core concepts in Racket. Exploring that functionality and the standard library and all of that, that's going to happen slowly over time, and you have the entire internet for that. The main thing from these lectures is that we're going to explore kind of what makes Racket a little bit different than what you might be used to from something like OCaml. So in that vein, last week we looked at things like basic values and how they differ in concrete syntax from OCaml, but we also looked at things like lists and how that's a little different from OCaml, where in OCaml we have pairs and lists, and those are very different things that you can't mix them together. In Racket, pairs and lists are kind of one and the same, and it just depends how you interpret them and the meaning you put onto them. And, and lists have a specific definition about how you nest pairs, but it's a structure that you impose. It's not something that's like intrinsically typed like it is in OCaml. So today we're gonna go a little further and we're going to look at things like pattern matching, which are both in Racket and OCaml. And we're going to look at how they're a little bit different, uh, but in many ways they're similar. We're going to look at data types. What does it mean to define a data type in Racket versus OCaml? We're going to look at one of the uh, more interesting aspects of Racket, which is symbols. And we're going to look at something that's in many lisps called quote, unquote, and quasi quote. And that's going to be a whole new thing that we don't have in kind of standard OCaml. There are extensions to OCaml that have this, but I doubt that that was introduced to you in 3.30. So this is going to be a whole new thing that uh, you may not have seen in any other language you've programmed in. And so that's going to be really exciting. So without further ado, let's take a deeper look at Racket. Let's start with pattern matching. So as before, we have an OCaml REPL on top and a Racket REPL on the bottom. And we're going to compare the two, not because they're the same, but because we want to use OCaml as a reference point for learning Racket. So how do we define a function that uses pattern matching in OCaml? Well, let's define a function that given a single digit, we can determine whether it's even. So we'll call it even digit and it takes a number and in OCaml we say match we're going to match on n and we can provide a set of different patterns that this number may or may not match and so uh, you know we could do that this is going to be a little tedious but we'll get through it and I'm not defining it this way because it's the best way to define this function I'm defining it this way because we want to explore uh, the nature of patterns. Almost done. And because we're talking about one digit, if it's not any of those, we can use the underscore, which says anything else would be false. And we can hit enter. And then OCaml, the REPL is telling us, okay, you've defined a value called even digit and its type takes an integer, gives you back a boolean. And then we can do something like even digit one, and we get false. Fantastic. So that's pattern matching on integers. Fine. In OCaml, we're also able to pattern match on other types. So for example, uh, we can define a swap function, which is going to take a pair and swap the first and the second elements of that pair. And then we'll We'll write an equivalent function in Racket. So to do that, we say swap, and then we match P with, and then here, we still do the same syntax, but a, a pair, there's only one alternative, right? So we'll talk about that difference here. So we have X, Y, and we want to return Y, X, and that's the extent of that. Did I miss anything? No. And it tells us, okay, the type of swap is a function that takes a pair of A and B 
and gives you a pair of B and A. Fantastic. And so we could call swap on uh, A and B, string and character, and we would get B and A, which is a character and a string. Fantastic. Really great. So that's an OCaml. And we can do the same for lists, et cetera, et cetera, as I'm sure you've seen, and we'll, and we'll go through some examples. But um, one of the things we want to talk about here is in OCaml, we're already seeing something that's going to be different from what we see in Racket, which is that all of the alternatives have to be of the same type. So in the even digit, all of those alternatives had to be integers. Let's try to define uh, even digit in a different way. So uh, let's say let even digit of n equals match n with, and it's we're going to make it wrong anyway, but we'll save it. If it's zero, it's true. But if we see the pair x, y, that's false, because that's obviously not e even, right? So that, oh, and OCaml complains. It says this pattern matches a value of type AB, but the pattern was expected to match values of type int. So it's saying this doesn't make any sense because one of your alternatives matches on integers and the other alternative matches on pairs. Those aren't the same type. What's going on with that? So OCaml is enforcing that. And furthermore, OCaml uses that to determine whether things are exhaustive. So for example, let's go with even digit again, and let's say we're very lazy, so we're just going to match on zero. And we say if it's zero, then it's true, and I'm too lazy, so I don't want to define the rest. And it's not an error, but now OCaml is saying, whoa, 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 this pattern matching, you're not covering all cases here, right? Um, and it actually gives me an example very helpfully of a pattern that isn't matched. It says the integer one would not be matched by this function. And that's where uh, OCaml gives us the ability. Let me clear the screen here. OCaml gives us the ability to use what's called a wild card, right? So we can match n with. And then this would still be wrong. It would still be logically wrong, but uh, it would match all the possible patterns. So notice, it doesn't tell us it's wrong. It can't know. It can't possibly know it's wrong in this case. But it doesn't complain about it being non-exhaustive because the underscore says, if it's anything else, give me false. OK, now let's look at swap again. I, I could have just rewritten it. I'll just rewrite. So let's swap on some pair equals match p with x y is y x. So here, there's only one pattern, and it doesn't complain that it's non-exhaustive, because OCaml knows statically, because of the nature of its type system, that if you're trying to match on a pair, there's only one alternative. There's only one shape that could be. Okay. So Racket's going to be much more flexible because of its type system. It's going to allow you to uh, pattern match on things of different types, and that's okay. And so we'll look at some examples of that. So lastly, in the OCaml front, I think it might be useful to look at one example with lists, and a classic example for that is the uh, sum function. So here we have to, you know, in OCaml, we have to declare recursive functions explicitly. So we say let rec, and we say let rec sum on some lists called x's. Uh, and we say match x is with, and we know that because we're matching on a list, there's two alternatives really. There's the empty list, and if it's the empty list, the sum is zero. And there's the cons case, which we'll call x x's. And because we're doing the sum, that's going to be uh, x plus sum, the recursive call on x's. And am I forgetting anything? I don't think so. So let's hit enter there. And if we say sum one, two, three, we get six indeed. So it didn't complain about exhaustive patterns because we covered all the possible patterns. On list, there's only two 
different cases. Now we could have other patterns. So we could, I'm just going to make something up here. So let, you know, let fun on X is equals. And then we could say match X is with, and here we could say if it's the empty list, we do we return one, but if it's um, uh, a list with two elements, so we can say like x cons y cons y's, then return two, and we can say here if it's x uh, uh, if it's anything else, we could say so we could say x y's then return three. And this also will not complain about exhaustive patterns. So we had more than two, but that's also okay because we covered all of the possible bases. We were just more specific and being more specific is okay in this case. Okay, so let's talk about how some of these functions look in Racket. So in Racket, matching is really, really similar when it comes to integers. So let's define the same function. Let's say define even digit. So we'll use the kind of racket syntax here. Uh, their convention is to use uh, the hyphen instead of the underscore. And so we will stay with that convention, but I forgot a bracket here. There we go. So we're going to define even digit. And just like in OCaml, there's the match uh, keyword and we match on N. And here again, this is going to be convention. I'm going to use square bracket. But as we talked about last lecture, it doesn't have to be square bracket. This could be uh, parentheses. It could be a curly bracket. All of those are fine. It's just convention when you're doing the matches to use square bracket to kind of help visually, but it's not required. Uh, so we can say zero. And if it's zero, it's true. So already that's a little different. You know, in OCaml, there was like the arrow here. None of that. For in, in racket, you're going to have uh, kind of in, in brackets, you're going to have some expression on the left or on right after the opening bracket and some expression on the right. And the way it works is if the thing you're matching matches the thing on the left, the result is the thing on the right. Syntactically very sparse as, as we've seen, like many things are in racket. So we can do two, and that's the same thing. Uh, four, and that's the same thing. And we're being, it's a little tedious. I kind of regret choosing this function. Here we are. And then, just like in OCaml, we can use the underscore as the wildcard. And here it would be false. All right? So now, what we have to do is close everything up. So we have to close the bracket around match and we have to close the bracket around define. And if I hit enter, it's fine with that. And let's try it. Let's try even digit on three. It says it's false. Let's try even digit on two. It says it's true. Fantastic. So that's our first pattern match. Let's look at swap, right? So swap, uh, let's remind ourselves so this one will be, I think, uh, interesting to see the comparison right in front of us. So in OCaml, swap on P looked like this. Uh, match P with X, Y, and we give back Y, X. And in Racket, we can say define swap on some pair. And we're going to say match P. And here, remember, for pairs in racket, we use the cons function. So what's interesting here is we're going to use it as a pattern as well. Um, so here, cons x, y. And we close that. And now this whole thing in brackets is the thing on the left, the thing we're matching against. And if that turns out to be the thing we've got, then we swap them. And that ends that alternative. So up here, we had an alternative and in the OCaml syntax, an alternative starts with the pipe character, 
you have the pattern you're matching, then you have the arrow to separate the, the pattern from the result. In Racket, an alternative is a thing in brackets. Again, the convention is to use square brackets, which so doesn't have to be. And the thing in those brackets is going to have two expressions. The left expression is the thing you're trying to match against, and the right expression is the result. So this is the equivalent thing. We'll close all of the appropriate bra brackets. And now if we do swap on cons one, two, we get cons of two, one. And as before, we could absolutely have any types here and that's fine too. Um, now, no one's asking this because this isn't live, but you might think, okay, but aren't cons also the list thing? So what if, what if we called swap on a thing that had the empty list here? What would happen? So that's a list. And what do we get? Well, it swaps them happily because swap is defined over con cells and con cells are used for lists and for pairs. And that's just the way racket is defined to be. So there's nothing broken about this. Uh, there's nothing wrong about this. It's just the way that Racket uses the same functionality for lists and for pairs. So again, it's on you, the programmer, to make sure that you're using things in the appropriate manner, or I shouldn't say appropriate, in the way you intended to. Okay, so we can match on cons, as we've seen. And so the other thing we looked at in OCaml was lists. So let's look at lists. So cons is one of them, but so is the empty list. Is the other thing. So let's let's do uh, sum again. So here we don't have to e explicitly say, "Oh, racket, this is going to be re recursive." We don't have to do that. It's fine to just make it uh, recursive, no problem at all. And here we're going to match x's, and it's a list. And the first thing we want to do is check against the empty list, right? And that's the racket syntax for the empty list. And if it's the empty list, the sum is zero. And if it's, uh, if it's a cons, we'll have some cons x x's, and that's shadowing, uh, just like in OCaml, you can shadow the above bindings. And if it's those, it will be plus x, and then the result of com calling sum on x's. Close all the appropriate brackets. This closes the match, and this closes the define, I think. Cool. And let's try calling sum on list one, two, three. And we get six. Fun. Now, here's another interesting thing about pattern matching in Racket. For lists, there's a special way you can pattern match on lists in Racket. So let me just show you an example. So I can say define f on x's, and x's we're going to say is a list, and we can say match x's, and here we can say one, two, three. Now this seems weird because the the list function uh, constructs a list, and that is true. But in Racket we can also use it to pattern match against a list, and let's say if it is that list we we say true. And we can say, otherwise, it's false. So what happens here? Let's close the match. Let's close the define. So if I call f on list one, two, three, we expect true. And we get true. If I call f on list one, two, four, we get false. But here's where it gets fun. What if I call f on cons one, cons two, cons three, empty list, close cons three, close cons two. And I think that's it. We get true. So notice it doesn't have to match the way we syntactically constructed the list. What it's saying is that if the list matches the same list that this would generate, then you get this result, which is why we got true here. 
So this cons one, cons two, cons three, empty list kind of list that we manually constructed using cons does indeed match this pattern. So this can be nice because it can be nice to uh, use this shorthand to pattern match instead of having to like, if there's, if there's a specific shape of list you're trying to match against, it can be tedious to have all these different cons. So that makes it nice. So pattern matching in Racket, as you can see, very similar to pattern matching in OCaml with some differences. So what are the main differences here? One, we can, uh, you know, in OCaml, every alternative has to be of the same type. In Racket, types don't have the same meaning, so it's more flexible, right? It didn't care if we matched cons as a pair or cons as a list. There's no distinction. So how would it know whether you're, you're trying to match against lists or match against pairs? Because that's something you imbue on the program. Um, and in OCaml, there's this syntax, like concrete syntax, for separating the thing you're matching against from the result. You have this arrow, you have the pipe, etc. In in Racket, it's brackets as usual, and you have two expressions. One expression is the one you're matching. One expression is the one you're returning. Okay. Now we're going to talk about data types. So in the top REPL, we're going to look at OCaml's syntax for data types, which is actually quite nice. Let's say we wanted to define a data type for binary trees. We might call it BT, and we're going to have two constructors. We're going to say there's leaf, where there's no associated data. It's kind of the empty tree. And we're going to have the constructor node, where there is some associated data, uh, three bits of it, actually. We have the two child trees and int for kind of the data, the, the node data. So we hit enter. OCaml says, yep. And then, of course, we can do all the things we can do with data types. So we could define values of this data type, for example. So my tree equals node five leaf leaf. And OCaml's happy with that. We can also define functions over this data type where we take a tree and it equals let me say match t width. Uh, if it's leaf then indeed this is empty so that's true and node we don't care about the associated data so we're going to use the wild card and say it's false right and so now we have a value of bt and a function over bt and so we can of course call our function over our value and that is indeed false so there's a few things to point out about defining data types in OCaml. And so one is we've defined two constructors here, leaf and node, but they're both associated with the type BT. So we actually can get clashes in OCaml and compiler errors if we try to use leaf in something that expects a pair, right? So very simply, so let's define swap again. Um, swap p equals match with oh, p with and if I try to call call swap on my tree, or we don't even have to do that, we can just say swap on leaf. It's gonna complain. Oh no, you can't do that, blah blah blah. Because our function was over pairs and leaf is a bt right and node is a bt and we know this because if we create a value uh, for example like my tree which is of a node type or it's it's of a bt type right so it's telling us there right so node is associated with the bt type and leaf is associated with the bt type and in the opposite direction, the BT type only has two constructors, leaf and node. So OCaml knows all of this, keeps track of all of this, and that's part of how it does its type checking. In Racket, things are going to be a little different. So let's think, let's uh, look at that. We don't have to think about it, let's just look at it. Okay, so in 
racket, the equivalent would be using structures. So we can say struct leaf and has no associated data. So we just have kind of these empty brackets here and we hit enter. And then we have struct of node. And here we're going to say there's three bits of data. I left and right. Okay. So here we've kind of defined in a sense, two constructors or structures is, is, is the racket terminology here, but they aren't associated with each other in any enforced way. If they're associated with each other, it's because we want them to be associated with each other. And we're going to write programs where these two things are closely related, but they're just two structure definitions that could be wholly unrelated. So if we call leaf, we get leaf, that's fine. Uh, we can create, so we can define a value here. We'll say, we'll call it my tree and it'll be the same value we had before. It'll be of the node. What did I, what number did I use? Oh, five. And then leaf, lots of brackets in bracket leaf. Okay, that closes the node and that closes the define. And so now I can say my tree. And it says it's a node and it doesn't give us any of the uh, underlying information. So that's also a little different. Um, but we'll see. We can still get the stuff out because we can pattern match on these things. So uh, let's define uh, kind of our is empty but using the racket idioms. So one of the differences here is we would define it as follows. We would call it BT empty, huh? Uh, and it's going to take BT. Now remember BT isn't anything we've defined here in Racket, right? BT is us using a convention. So we're saying um, we're defining this function and the way we're gonna define it is we're going to match on BT and our first match is going to be on leaf. And if it is leaf, that will be true. And I can close that alternative. And if it is node underscore underscore underscore, because a node has three bits of associated data, but here we don't care what they are. We say that's false. We close the match, we close the define. And now we can call bt empty huh oh, empty huh on my tree. Forgot how to type there for a second. And we get false. So this looks really similar to the OCaml thing, but actually something quite different is happening here. And in particular, remember leaf and node are not enforced to be associated with each other. That is a meaning we are putting onto this program. So remember earlier, I tried to define swap uh, and use swap on leaf and it complained or whatever. Let's define our own swap down here again. So let's define swap on some P and what are we gonna do? So before we had where we would match and match on P, yeah, blank out for a second. And if it's cons X, Y, we want it to be cons Y, X. Fantastic. But now we can also make it so if someone passed in a node with our data and our left and right child nodes, we could, oh, I should keep track of the data there actually, not use the wildcard. We could return back the node with the left and right swapped. Okay, and we close the match, close the define. So now if we call swap on cons one, two, we get two, one, and it's very happy with that. And if we call swap on node five, uh, this is going to be a little less interesting. Oh, let's just nest it. So here we'll, we'll use it 
value three, and here I'll say my tree, which we defined, and the other one will be leaf. Uh, this closes the node, this closes the call to swap. Oh, it doesn't print it out. <laughs> I forgot about that part. Uh, but rest assured, <laughs> it's the right thing. So actually, um, we can define functions to help us out here. So um, we can define uh, get left, which takes a tree of BD, and how would we define that? We could say match BT. And so what's interesting here is this, we, there's a few ways we could go about it, right? Um, in general, this is probably a partial function. I'm going to define it as a partial function, uh, which means we're not going to define it for, it's not going to be valid for every input. So if it's an empty tree, this function doesn't apply. Um, so we're going to say node, we have I, oh, here we don't care, left, and then we don't care about right because the result is just the left thing. And we can close that, close the match, close the define. So now if I call get left on the result of that swap, we expect it to be leaf. Nice. So the swap worked. <laughs> so all of this was just to show we've defined two structs. One of them is called node. One of them is called leaf, but they don't, they aren't necessarily associated with each other. We wrote a function where we matched on cons and node, even though cons and node aren't of the same type, right? Cons is pairs and lists and other structures like that. But node is this other thing we just defined. And yet here we were able to write swap, uh, and pattern match on both of them. So that's very different than the OCaml stuff. In some ways, this is more flexible, right? You can define swap and it can have very valid meanings on all sorts of different inputs, okay? But that also means now it's up to you to enforce certain things about your program. And that's exactly what we were talking about last week in the Q&A section when it came to using cons for pairs versus lists. It's convention, it's you enforcing it. The flexibility is a double-edged sword. And that's okay. It's the point in the design space that the racket folks and the OCaml folks don't agree on. And that's okay. But it's worth pointing out here that in our racket programs, things like this might come up. And we have to be aware that that's possible in this language. So that's pattern matching in racket. As you can see, for the most part, very similar to pattern matching in OCaml with some, uh, uh, different twists, and then add to that, that when you define data types in Racket versus OCaml, your pattern matching kind of can get even a little more, a little more different because you can pattern match on the, the structs you define, but the structs aren't necessarily associated with each other. So here we defined the struct that had leaf and node, but there's nothing forcing those things to be always used together. Uh, we can write functions that pattern match on nodes, and not on leafs. And that's okay because they don't, Racket isn't trying to enforce them. So if you have an OCaml data type that you'd like to translate to Racket, it's very possible as we, we just saw, but you have to know that the compiler is not going to enforce the same sort of things. And that's okay. So that was pattern matching and data types. And now we're going to move on to symbols. So for symbols, there isn't really an equivalent in OCaml, the closest thing is constructors that don't have any data. So what do I mean by that? So let's define something called uh, sim, and we could imagine uh, sim having a whole bunch of different constructors. So one could be, we'll just call it sim, why not? And another would be uh, sim2. Uh, actually, I don't know if OCaml is going to like this. Let's see. Ah, that's fine. Cool. So these are two constructors, but they don't have associated data. So you can pattern match on it. You can say, is this sim or is this sim2? And that's fine. But there's nothing inside of them, right? They just kind of are. Okay. 
What's that have to do with symbols and racket? Well, again, there's no direct analog, but the closest thing is that sort of constructor. So how do we write a symbol and racket? Well, you do tick and then all, you know, a string you want. So we could have tick Jose, and that is a symbol. And that's fine. We could have tick sim, and that is a symbol. We could have tick sim two, and that's a symbol too. Now, notice we didn't have to define a data type. So if we go back to OCaml, I, if I just type Jose, it's like, whoa, what is this thing, Jose, you're referencing? And it doesn't exist. We didn't define a type that had Jose, and that's OK. But remember, Racket has a different notion of type system. And a symbol, you can come up with any on the fly, whatever you want. So we could have one called uh, 430. Uh, and that's a symbol. But the key point here is they're kind of flat. They don't have associated data. So the, what? why do we have symbols? Why are they useful? Well, they're useful as like tags, right? You can compare them. Are they equal to each other, right? So there's the a function in Racket called uh, equal, huh? Equal, huh? And we can say is uh, CMSC equal to CMSC. Did I spell them right? Yeah. And that'll say true. And is, uh, are these two equal? And that'll say false. And that's pretty much the only interesting computation we can do on symbols. Are they this, are these two symbols the same? And so they're really used as like tags. So let's define a function over sim uh, symbols. So uh, we can define a function called beetle hunt. And beetle huh takes some something, and we can match x. And beetle huh says, uh, Paul, yeah, that person's a beetle. Uh, we can say, John, sure, that person's a beetle. George, I I perpetuated the. An uh, order that I wasn't trying to to imply here. So our Beatles fans and Ringo, and maybe you feel that uh, Billy Preston is the the fifth Beatle. So we'll say Billy is also a Beatle, and anything else. I accidentally put two new lines there, not on purpose. Uh, not a Beatle. okay. And so now we can call Beatle. Beetle hunt on Paul, and it gets true. But if we call Beetle hunt on CMC 430, we're not a Beetle. That's fine. So it's a lot like nullary constructors, which we have in OCaml, but you don't have to define them as part of some type. You can just use them where necessary. Now, that's the bit where they come really useful because you can use them when you need to generate some new fresh name for a thing, and this will come up in class. You can use a function called gensim, which stands for generate symbol. And gensim will, will say, here is a symbol that definitely isn't being used in your program. That's a pretty powerful thing. Uh, so if I keep calling this, I'll keep getting different ones. So in this case, you can tell it's not crypto cryptographically secure because it's just doing sequential things. But it's saying, when you call gensim, I'm going to give you back a symbol that definitely won't clash with the symbol you're using. Another thing you can do is give it a prefix. So I can say gensim cmsc, and it will give you the same guarantee. This is a symbol that does not clash with the symbol you're currently using, uh, but with the prefix you've given me. And so this is going to come up a lot in compilers where we need to create fresh names or create labels for things because we're generating code. And what's the label of the thing we're going to jump to? You know, uh, I don't know. Well, let's just create let's create a symbol and use that as our label. And we can use gensim to make sure we don't clash with any other label. So that's going to be the main point in this class for using um, symbols and gensim. But um, They'll also come up in a few other contexts. So basically, a lot like 
constructors, right? We had the leaf, you know, structure before, and this is similar in that there's no associated data with it, um, but we can generate them on the fly. We don't have to define them up front. And so symbols give us that flexibility. So, you know, once we're doing code generation, I think this will become more clear. Usually what people end up doing without things like symbols is they'll generate a random integer and then convert that to a string, right? Okay, fair enough. That would accomplish the same thing, but symbols are kind of built in to track it. So why not use this functionality? We can just get a symbol that we know is fresh, won't clash with anything else. And then we can use that for, for our purposes. So symbols are a useful thing for us. Again, if they don't seem too well motivated at the moment, I ask for your patience. I think you'll see once we start uh, doing some code generation that this will come in handy. The main thing to know about symbols, just to recap, is we have GenSim, and we can just get a new symbol that is has not been used yet. We can also pass a prefix to GenSim. And then the last thing worth knowing about symbols is that the main operation you can perform on symbols is are they equal uh, and then of course you can convert them to strings uh, symbol i believe the racket uh, function is called symbol string and if i call jensen on that i get a string back yeah so um, you're not doing kind of any interesting computation with symbols but you can check if they're equal you can generate new ones on the fly and then you can convert it to a string to print it out somewhere so that's a crash course on symbols. It will come up a lot in this class, but as you can see, there isn't too much to know about them. Just what functions you can use to create them, which is GenSim, basically. So now we're gonna talk about quote, unquote, and quasi-quote, which are very lispy concepts. So I've removed the OCaml REPL. We just had a racket REPL because there isn't quite an analog that you learned in 3.30, but that's okay. We're still, we're still going to cover it because it's really useful and it's just a difference from OCaml. So we can't compare. It's a new concept. It'll be fun. So this already came up in the Q&A a little bit and you've seen it whenever we've created a list and Racket prints it back using this syntax. This is very related to what we're about to cover. So let's start with quote. So there's a function in Racket called quote. And quote can take, uh, I don't know, anything you want. So it can take a string. And what do we get back? We get back that string. Okay. So far, not too interesting. Um, we can give it a number and we get back a number. Okay. Fair enough. Um, but what if we give it a list? of things. So notice here I did a list, but I didn't preface it with the list function. I just said, oh, instead of x, y, x, let's do x, y, z. Ah, interesting. So that's a different behavior. And this is a little, little different. I, you know, earlier I was like, oh, when you have open bracket, that's kind of, you're calling a function. Well, here that's not what's happening. So what exactly is going on? Quote is special in Racket and most Lisps. And it's saying, I'm going to take the argument and quote it. I'm not going to evaluate it. I'm just going to take it as is, as you've given it to me. So here you gave me this thing in brackets, x, y, z. And I'm not going to try to evaluate that, which would involve calling the function x, which we don't have here. I'm just going to take it as you've given to me. And what's the result? It's a list where you have three things in that list, x, y, and z. So here it could be numbers too, right? Or it could be strings. Um, it could even be symbols. Um, this is a sim and a sim too. And all of that is fine. And if you'll notice, every time I call quote, the result has this tick in front. But otherwise, 
it's exactly what I gave it in terms of the concrete syntax. So that's the other thing to know about quote, is that this tick is shorthand for quote, which means I can use that tick wherever I could have used quote. All right, so I'm going to slow down here a bit because what I've just shown is a really convenient way to construct lists. So before I showed you this way where you give you use the function list and you know you get a list out, but in this particular case, these are equivalent. Now, you'll still see me use list a lot, even though it's more verbose. The reason is because list constructs a proper list, right? And uh, quote can construct a proper list, but you can also construct all sorts of data structures with quote, not, not just lists, um, which that's not a bad thing, that's a feature, but it's just much more flexible. Whereas list, every argument you give to me, I put in a list and with quote, um, it's kind of it's kind of doing that as I say it out loud, but it's uh, you can also once we get into unquote and quasi quote you can construct all sorts of data structures, and so uh, I like using list because it makes my intent clear, right? Um, when I when you see the list function being used, you know exactly what I'm trying to accomplish. When you see quote, it could be that I'm trying to accomplish the same thing, and often I will be. Um, uh, but sometimes I won't be, and so the, the intent isn't as clear with quote as it is with list. But that's a personal preference thing. There's, no, there's nothing wrong about constructing lists uh, this way. You know, that's completely fine. So that's quote. Um, so you can do fun things like give yourself little brain teasers um, like this. I think there's an example of this. Uh, oh, oh, did I, it was too many. That was the problem. Oh, okay. Um, give yourself little bin teasers like, okay, how could I construct that without using quote, right? So in this case, I believe it's, uh, list of empty lists and list of empty list and I believe there's two brackets here list of list of empty list I might get this wrong and that's okay oh oh those aren't the same that's the problem Okay, so I did get it wrong, but the thing I created was also valid. So, uh, yeah, so this one wasn't the list list, the nested list here. That was my mistake. So that means I can get rid of one set of brackets here, and I believe. Um, yeah, that looks more like it. Those two look the same. Yes. So that was the little brain teaser I just solved on the fly there. Uh, it's not necessarily um, deep or significant, or you don't necessarily need to be able to solve that sort of thing very quickly. Um, but it's important to know what's going on with quote and the way quote is working. So let's talk about it a little bit more. Um, there's actually um, a very specific way that quote gets evaluated. So uh, let's think about that. So if you call quote on a string, you get that string back. If you call quote on an integer, you get that integer back. But if you call quote on a list, Uh, yeah, let's do the let's just do this first. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. Um, notice that it didn't call 
list. It didn't evaluate it. So this goes back to what I was saying originally, where quote takes what you give it kind of at face value. So what is the thing we've gotten as a result? Well, it's actually quite interesting. What we have here is a list where the first element is the symbol list. And then we have three integers, one, two, three. So if I hit this, you'll notice these two things are the same. Okay, so that's taught us a little bit more about quote. So quote, uh, on basic values, you just get that basic value back. If you call quote on any sort of string, so here I don't mean string in this way, I mean without the scare quote, so I'll just say CMSC, what we get back is a symbol. So if you remember, we wrote symbols this way, and that tick is actually the very same tick. It's the quote tick. So you call quote on any sort of uh, string here. So we could say, you know, Monday, doesn't matter. And it's going to give you the symbol tick Monday. When you call quote on a list of things, uh, Monday, Tuesday, uh, that's all I want to write. What you get back is a list of those things but you can think of that as a list of symbols, if you'd like. You can kind of uh, distribute the tick over the list. So this actually relates to, if that's true, well, what's happening here? Because this is a list of one and three. Well, it turns out, if you do quote of one, you get one back. If you do quote of three, you get three back. This is actually no different than earlier when I said quote of one, you just get one back. Quote of three, you get three back. Quote of a string, you get string back. But quote of literally anything else, and you get a symbol. So why is quote useful? Well, right now we are only seeing quote as a way to create lists of things, right? So we can pass it in brackets, a big old list of things. So here we could have a list of CMSC. We could have a list of uh, integers. We could have strings and we could have well, symbols themselves. And when we hit enter, uh, we get that list back. Notice that's fine. You can just nest that arbitrarily deep. And that's okay. So what is quote doing? Quote takes whatever you give it at like face value. So even if you did call a function here, so let's say plus one, two, or plus one, one, two, why not? It's not going to evaluate that thing it's going to take it at face value. It's going to say, okay, I'm going to literally quote the thing you've given me. Does that mean that if I do tick plus, that's a symbol? Yep, it does mean that. So quote so far lets us construct strings, lets us construct, uh, oh, we didn't, we didn't try Booleans. Yeah, okay. <laughs> let's us construct booleans, let's us construct numbers, and it lets us construct symbols, right? So quote sim, and we get a symbol back. Um, and it lets us construct lists of things. So we can take a arbitrary list of things, provide it to quote, and it won't try to evaluate that as a function in racket. It'll just give us that list directly. So that's another shorthand way to write that list. But as you can see, quote also is kind of a little bit more general. It's doing these things with symbols. It's doing the, you know, uh, it's passing integers through unaltered in any way. Um, but that's quote. So next time, oh, uh,
One last thing. Oh, <laughs> of course. Um, so when we just had cons one, two, uh, we got the uh, one dot two syntax because that's showing it's a it's a pair, right? It's not nested as a list. Um, but we haven't seen how to uh, construct that until now. So we can say um, you can actually use it in reverse in the same way you can use um, tick to generate lists. You can also use tick to generate pairs in that same way. So that's fine. Uh, it's always a little tricky when you're trying to use quote to construct these things because uh, as you saw, I, I forgot that doesn't evaluate this. So yeah, quote is, is, is a, a little bit of a tricky concept because we're very used to in programming languages when we see kind of some sub expression that that sub expression gets evaluated in some way, but quote kind of breaks that, right? And in fact, the term that is used for this sort of stuff is meta programming, right? You're kind of manipulating the program itself in a way, right? You're saying, take this expression, which is cons one, two, but don't evaluate it. Treat it as uh, this like reified thing that you can hold on to. And then I'm going to do stuff with it. So quotes, quotes, a tricky, tricky one. Um, but it'll come up sometimes. We're not going to use it super heavily, but it will come up. So you got to be comfortable with quote. Um, now let's talk about, um, uh, yeah, let me think what I want to do now. Uh -huh. Okay. Up next is quasi quote, which is very, very similar to quote. And in fact, for the current things we've seen, it's going to be identical. So whereas quote, the tick was shorthand for quote, we have back tick being a shorthand for uh, quasi quote. Well, quasi quote. So what's the difference? Well, for the things we've looked at so far, it's going to be the same. So let's let's be precise. So let's say backtick on one, on an integer. What do we get? We get that integer. Backtick on a Boolean. We get that Boolean. Backtick on a string. We get that string. And backtick on uh, unquoted string, kind of like a symbol. We get a symbol. So as you can see, so far, the same 
thing as quote, which is convenient because the name is very related. Quasi quote is a lot like quote. But the difference between quote and quasi quote is that with quasi quotes, you can unquote things. So I'm going to clear this and we're going to go through this slowly because it's very important. So where quasi quote is backtick and we can have a bunch of stuff here. Unquote is uh, comma. I meant comma, but I did up. Uh, unquote is comma. And you can have another expression. So what use is that? I'll show you. Let's define a value. So this is going to be, let's define uh, our val as 10. So we have a value that is the integer 10. Fantastic. So now what I want to do is I want to create something with quasi quote where we're creating a structure based on things, but I want to use our value. So if I just type our val like that, well, that doesn't work because what's happening is we actually get symbol our val, which isn't what we wanted. What I wanted was 10 in there. Okay. So with quasi quote, you know, notice the result would have been the same with quote, but with quasi quote, what I can do is unquote and then have an expression. And what Racket will do is take the value of that expression and put it in the quote. So if I hit enter here, what happens? We get one, two, three, ten instead of one, two, three, our val. So that's the difference between quote and quasi quote. Because if I did this with quote, it just takes the unquote as a symbol itself. It doesn't, it, we haven't gained anything. But with quasi quote, we're saying, I want to be able to escape the quoting, evaluate something and put that into our quote. So it doesn't just have to be values like this. We can do arbitrary computation. We can say 10 plus our val. So notice the unquote is going to evaluate this entire expression and put that into our structure. Now, what happens if I add stuff here? So you might want to take a second to think about it. Have a hypothesis in your brain. What's going to happen when I hit enter? And let's see if you were right. Okay. Uh, was that illuminating? Was that not illuminating? Hard to tell. So think about what you think is going to happen. Have a hypothesis in your head. And then I'm going to hit enter. Is that what you thought would happen? Is that not what you thought would happen? So I imagine for this one, you probably got it right. And if you didn't, uh, that's okay. Let me know what the confusion was and I'll help iron that out. But for this one, I know when I first learned about racket, I got this one very wrong. So why is this the symbol our vowel instead of using 10? I, I had unquote here. Shouldn't it unquote all the way? Well, the answer is no, clearly, because of what this uh, evaluated to. But the reason is that unquote unquotes a single expression. And this single expression is everything between the brackets. And then we're back in quote mode. It's not about white space. Notice there's white space here. It's about the brackets enclosing that expression. And then here we're back in quote mode. So if I wanted to put our, our vowel in the quote again, I'd have to unquote it again. And then it would evaluate our vowel and put that into the quote. So that's the difference between quasi quote and quote. Like I said, quasi quote lets you unquote things, whereas just quote doesn't let you escape the quoting, right? You're not going to evaluate anything in the wider environment. You're just going to take the literal thing you've passed quote and create a data structure out of it. So 
quasi quote is really useful because it lets you manipulate things based on your current environment. Um, so what else can we do? Um, ah, there's one last trick up our sleeves. Sorry about that. And that's unquote splicing. So we defined our vowel and it was like a flat value. So let's define a list. Uh, we'll call it our list. And now we have this nice quote way to make fun lists. Actually, let me, uh, let me make it a list of symbols. Okay, so we have our list. It's a list of symbols. Fantastic. So what if I wanted to create a data structure that had this list of symbols in it? Well, we just learned about quasi code. So your first instinct might be to do this. Let's uh, quasi quote on some list and then unquote our list into that list. And this will indeed do what you think it might do. But notice the nesting is very specific. It's doing exactly what we asked it to. Our list is a list. But notice this is actually a five element list where the fifth element, uh, good movie, is itself a list. And maybe that's not what we wanted. Maybe what we wanted is that this list is flattened out into the wider list, okay? That's a reasonable thing to want. Well, how do we get that? It's called unquote splicing and the syntax is very similar to unquote, except we add the at symbol. And now when we hit enter, you'll notice it has taken the values in our list and flattened them into the resulting list. So here we have a, an eight element list where the elements from our list are uh, kind of put into the list. I don't want to say appended because notice here we could, uh, we could do this. Uh, so it's not that it puts them at the end or anything like that. It's that it kind of flattens it into the structure. So that is different from this, where this is this is an eight element list, or no, uh, yeah, it is. This is an eight element list, where the fifth element is itself a list. Whereas this is an eleven element list where our list is kind of interspersed. Now, just like with unquote, with unquote splicing, we can do arbitrary computation here. So we could in fact append uh, our list to our list. I don't know if that would be useful. Uh, oh, oh, I did append instead of append. And so, when we did the unquote splice here, it evaluated this expression and then what's called spliced the result of that into our list, which keeps it a flat structure here. If the list we are splicing in is itself nested, so let's do that. Let's create, um, let's create a nested list here. So what's the easiest way to create a nested list? We can say cons our list. Uh, that's the symbol I was looking for. So now what is the value of this expression? Okay, well, this is a list where the single element of that list is our list. So what do we think this unquote splice is going to do? Well, it's going to uh, take the element of the outer list, the elements of the outer list, and include them in the list we're constructing. But the element is itself a list. So you have to be thinking about levels, how nested are my lists, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it can get tricky, and it can be a little mind bendy. Right. This is very different to other styles of programming there. You may have experienced metaprogramming 
in some languages, there are languages that have support for metaprogramming. But most of what people call macros or things like that in C are a very simple form. Uh, some would say not even correct form of this sort of metaprogramming. Here in Racket, we're able to grab parts of the program itself and manipulate them. Right. So here we could grab um, this program, compute it, put it into a data structure. We can quote, uh, like I said, our list. Uh, we can we can splice that in. We can do arbitrary computation and create the data structure. So there's a lot to unpack here. My recommendation is that you very carefully read the lecture notes. What I've gone over here is mostly just an introduction. I don't think you can get everything in a just 20 minute introduction to quote unquote and quasi quote. I think this is a thing where you definitely want to practice at the terminal. So in the same way where I just created a whole bunch of things like this. Uh, oh, uh, and I gave, I, I gave myself, okay, let me construct a list um, that has the same, the same time. I, I just nerd sniped myself, which is pretty fascinating. I think this is it. Yeah. So you want to set yourself puzzles like that. Make sure you understand what quote is doing. Make sure you understand how the nesting works, right? When you have lists of lists, how does that work with quote, right? And it's going to come up again, not a ton. It's not like everything we do is going to be dealing with quote and unquote, but it will come up, right? It is going to happen in the class. So you should develop some familiarity with it. There's a little bit more discussion of it on the lecture notes. And there's a little bit discussion of this uh, notion called S expressions, um, which I, I do suggest you read. This class last semester and the semester before used S expressions much more heavily. This semester, we're going to use it less. And we're going to use the structs that I showed you, the racket structs. We're going to use that a little bit more. There are pros and cons to each. That being said, I'm leaving the lecture notes on S expressions up because I think it, it will be useful for you to be exposed to them. But the main thing that you should get out of these this lecture today is pattern matching, because that's going to come up all the time. Symbols. And, gonna, and again, there's not actually a lot to symbols. They're relatively simple, but you should still understand them. And quote, unquote, and quasi quote. Those are the main things to get out of this. And if you read the lecture notes, there's other examples. There's some more explanation. And of course, we'll have the Q&A where you can ask me questions. Come to office hours if it's confusing. This will come up throughout the semester. So let's get a good foundation here. But on Thursday, we're done talking about Racket as its own object of study. And we're going to write our first two compilers on Thursday. So on Thursday, We'll have written two simple compilers, and we'll, we'll use all of the things we've discussed here. I believe maybe we won't use unquote and unquote. I don't remember off the top of my head, but everything else is going to come up. So make sure you're comfortable with it.